My name is Alexandra Kovalenko. I'm from Kyiv, Ukraine, and today we'll be speaking about the fourth violation and the struggles religious organizations are facing in Ukraine uh, during the time of uh, war of Russian Federation against Ukraine. I will share my screen and show you the presentation I've prepared. Of course, uh, churches as well as all the other parts of the Ukrainian society are highly affected by war. And in my presentation, I will firstly talk about the brief overview of religious uh, situation in Ukraine, uh, just to, for you to understand the context. Then I will speak more about how religious organizations are affected uh, by current uh, war. Uh, and uh, I will also cover uh, the situation during the occupation during the past eight years from 2014 and uh, how the freedom of religion and belief was uh, violated on the occupied territories. And in the end, I would share some useful resources that you can use because, like, of course, I cannot cover everything in 20 minutes, but you can refer to those uh, studies uh, in case you need more information. First of all, I will show you the results of the sociological study by Rosenkov Center. Uh, it's a study that has been conducted annually since 2000, so for more than 20 years, and it shows the trends uh, of religiosity of Ukrainian society. Uh, it also has in-depth interviews with focus groups, which are also quite representative. Uh, and uh, by this research, you can see how the situation has been changing throughout the years. So, as you can see on this screen, the majority of uh, Ukrainians, they do identify themselves as believers. Uh, the percent uh, in 2021 was 67.8%. Uh, uh, the percentage of people who waver between faith and non-belief are 13%. Non-believers around 6%. Convinced atheists 3.4%. And people who found it hard to answer the question or they don't uh, care much about religion around 10%. You can also see that that throughout the year the highest percentage of people who uh, said that they were believers was in 2014. So it's the, after the revolution of dignity, uh, the annexation of Crimea, when the war started, uh, people came to church and uh, more people identified themselves as believers. And we also can predict that in 2022 these numbers will be even higher. Uh, me personally, I have example of my friends who were not that religious before, but after the war they of course come to church for comfort, for support, so these numbers will get higher. Of course, the majority of uh, people in Ukraine, uh, they are Orthodox historically, but uh, it's not uh, the only uh, religious community, uh, of course, in our country. Uh, we have uh, Protestant churches present, very present. I would say that in social life and in different initiatives, youth work, they sometimes are even more active than uh, Orthodox churches. Uh, we have Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics, and historically, again, we have a uh, Jewish uh, community, we have uh, Muslim community, Crimean Tatars are Muslims, uh, but also we have Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Paganism, and new religious movements. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, Ukrainian legislation is quite flexible and open, so uh, pretty much uh, if you have 10 people, you can register a religious community and have your activities. Uh, it's not... Uh, controlled by the state and like you can even have the community without the registration you need just the registration if you want the bank account but uh, if you find without that uh, you can just have a community and uh, have services and uh, do all the necessary activities without permission from the state Speaking about the effects the war had on religious uh, communities, first of all, it's of course the uh, destruction and effects on religious buildings. Uh, so uh, I used here the data from the report of the Institute of Religious Freedom, which they published in the middle of July this year. Uh, and by that point, uh, there were at least uh, 270 uh, spiritual sites uh, in eight regions of Ukraine, which were uh, damaged or highly affected, uh, even ruined sometimes, uh, due to the war. Uh, during the first two months, it was uh, on average two churches per day were uh, either destroyed completely uh, or damaged uh, because of the war and because of the uh, constant challenge. Uh, 
Uh, here on the screen you can see uh, the map uh, and uh, by the link you also you will have the whole report which is very comprehensive and it's uh, I think very interesting to watch it is in English uh, so basically the most affected areas are the uh, Kharkiv region uh, Luhansk and Donetsk regions uh, and the Kyiv region uh, during uh, March and April while the Russian troops were still near Kyiv uh, lots of the churches were destroyed and there is also other research which was done by the uh, group of uh, Ukrainian uh, religious scholar studies which is called religion of fire they visited themselves places in Kyiv region and filmed uh, the churches the destruction the icons sometimes with like signs of bullets in them so uh, they also published the results of uh, the first six months of the uh, research recently and I also leave you the link to that it is interesting when we look at confessional affiliation because the majority of the churches which were destroyed are the churches of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, then we have Baptist churches, uh, 33, uh, 32 uh, Pentecostal churches, uh, Ukrainian um, Greek Catholics, 17, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, 18. Uh, but the majority of these churches, uh, like around 50%, at least 108 churches, are the churches of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, it's also quite easy because uh, to understand because uh, the uh, this church is uh, prevalent uh, in the eastern and uh, southern part of Ukraine, so they have lots of uh, church buildings and they are affected. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, while they're communicating in the news about like churches being destroyed or uh, priests being killed, they are not always clear in their language. So, like reading their news from the official website of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, you cannot identify uh, honestly who did it. So it's like, oh, the church was destroyed, but they're not uh, openly saying that this, the church was destroyed as a result of the Russian shelling or like uh, as a result of the attack of Russian military. Uh, they like restrain themselves from this uh, particular kind of language. And it is also a problem. Uh, I will also speak more about that in uh, later uh, topics. Uh, here you can also see that there is an interactive map uh, in English with uh, more information on the destroyed buildings. Uh, you can see the names, the affiliation, uh, the uh, level of destruction, and it is also uh, quite convenient to use. Uh, another problem is that the part of these churches are our cultural heritage. Uh, there are some uh, 140 years old wooden churches that are being uh, burned to the ground and like uh, of course they cannot be restored uh, and they cannot be rebuilt from the ashes. Uh, this heritage we're basically losing right now. Uh, and also the Svetohirska Lavra, which is uh, situated in the Nesk region, it was highly affected. A few pictures uh, I will show like here, it's a picture of Svetohirsk Lavra and the first screen with the bullets on the icon is also from Svetohirsk Lavra. People were hiding there, uh, but still it was shelled uh, quite uh, intensively. First of all, because the uh, monastery itself is situated on the hill, so uh, it has a very strategic like placement and it was important for Russian military to take this point because over there you can basically see the river and see if someone wants to cross the river. So the there were quite intense and some uh, buildings as you can see here they're destroyed completely another topic is that Russian military they uh, also kill the priests uh, and the, during the first uh, two months to three months uh, of the war at least five priests were killed and we know that sometimes they were aware that it was a priest for example father maxim kazuchina the priest of orthodox church of ukraine he was wearing a suit and uh, at the time he was uh, shot uh, by russian soldiers it happened in kiev region he was trying to evacuate on his car his car was stolen from him and he was uh, shot uh, dead uh, but at that time he was wearing like a priest attire so the military of course were aware that it is a priest and still they uh, killed him uh, another story was about the priest who went to collect the humanitarian aid in Bucha uh, and uh, two months later uh, his body was identified uh, that he was killed pretty much the same day. Also some priests are being kidnapped by the occupational authorities 
It happens in uh, the Parisia and Kherson region. Uh, we have uh, witness from uh, Father Sergei Chudinovich. Also, in that report I was uh, talking about earlier, they have the links to the video uh, recordings of the priests who tell their stories, uh, which you can also watch if you are interested. They tell what happened to them. Uh, and another uh, very like famous example was uh, Father Vasil Varazub, uh, who was a member of the Ukrainian Border Rescue Mission on Zmi the island. Uh, I think probably you heard the story on the first day uh, when the Russian warship uh, came to the Zmini island and they took prison our coast guards uh, and among them like after that there was a rescue uh, operation and among people on that rescue ship was uh, Father Vasily Vrazub. He was also taken into captivity. He was kept there for two and a half months uh, while suffering moral and physical torture which was reported by other people who were rescued before. They said that yes, uh, the priest is still in captivity and he's uh, suffering from uh, torture from the side of the Russian military. The possible motivations for such actions is that first of all uh, the occupying uh, powers, they're trying to force priests to cooperate with them because priests have uh, authority in communities, they can speak to people, they can uh, convey ideas. Uh, they also do this uh, in order to intimidate them or keep them silent if their position is uh, uh, pro-Ukrainian, against Russian forces. Of course, uh, they don't want this... Uh, ideas to be spread and talk to people. There is also pressure on denominations whose activities are undesirable uh, for the occupational regime. Uh, for example, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church or uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And uh, another reason is the blackmail in order to obtain a ransom for the exchange fund because like the priests are more valuable if I may say, uh, of course it's a horrible thing to say, but yet uh, are more valuable for the exchange fund uh, for later exchanges of war prisoners. But the other problem is that we have also the problem of collaboration of the priests of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate with the occupational forces. Uh, basically, uh, when there was a translation of the uh, so-called uh, presentation of results of the referendum of Kherson, the Parisia region, uh, on that video from uh, Kremlin, which was uh, shown on national uh, Russian TV, uh, there was spotted a few priests and even a bishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, and after that, uh, the official uh, church, they made a statement they, th that they support the uh, integrity of uh, Ukraine, they're against the invasion, but um, the fact that these uh, priests and uh, like even a bishop were present in Kremlin on this event, uh, it's kind of their personal business. So any actions from the side of the uh, Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church uh, were not officially taken against uh, those representatives of the church. They said it's more like their political opinion or their personal opinions. Uh, and uh, uh, even though uh, the society was expecting uh, some actions from them, I don't know, like changing the bishop or something like that, it did not happen. Speaking about the violation of uh, freedom of religion on the occupied territories, uh, I would like to speak uh, first of all about the occupied Crimea uh, where it was the forced implementation of the Russian legislation uh, which significantly worsened the situation of religious communities in Crimea. Before the occupation we had 2,083 religious communities. After that uh, the Russian uh, like legislation was implemented all of the religious communities were forced to re-register by uh, Russian law. Uh, the only church that had no problems doing it, of course, was the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. So after the procedure of free registration, we now have just around 700 uh, of uh, religious communities, religious organizations in the area. And the data is not sufficient because we don't uh, get the official uh, data uh, because Ukrainian um, like government and Ukrainian institutions are not uh, obviously acting uh, in the peninsula. The religious organizations uh, which are being persecuted are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormons, the Crimean Diocese uh, of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Ukrainian Christian Evangelical Church and uh, Muslims and Muslim uh, communities.
Uh, for example, uh, if we're speaking about the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, during the years of occupation, the number of parishes of uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine reduced from 49 to 5. Uh, and also there were reports that the church utensils uh, were stolen from the cathedral, uh, that uh, the community of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was evicted from a principal cathedral in Simferopol for a debt of around uh, three uh, Ukrainian hryvnias, which is around like nine euro cents. Uh, so for that debt, uh, the community was forced to leave the cathedral and the cathedral uh, was uh, taken away from them. And also in Yevpatoria, the occupation authorities ordered the demolition of the temple, uh, which was also a problem reported um, internationally by uh, Ukrainian government. The other group, religious group, which is highly affected are the Muslims, uh, because Crimean Tatars are uh, primarily uh, Muslim and they have the strong uh, communities. Uh, pretty much all of the religious organization of uh, Crimean Tatars are uh, prohibited on the peninsula for their political, uh, like, uh, terroristical, sometimes they call them as terroristic organizations, uh, they are banned and uh, there were also raids at Tatar homes, mosques, uh, media outlets and school, uh, which were reported uh, numerous times. The Jehovah's Witnesses and their activities are uh, recognized as extremists and banned in Russia. And also the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and Roma Catholic Church, they don't have the possibility to serve the services. They uh, are allowed to be in the territory of Crimea only for 90 days at a time, which also leads to problem for religious communities, obviously. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that all of these violations, they are war crimes, because uh, due to the international humanitarian law, the freedom of religion and belief is protected. Restricting uh, people's ability to perform religious rites and persecuting residents uh, for their religious beliefs is a war crime. Uh, but we've seen it uh, throughout all of these years, starting from 2014. It is still continuing now in the occupied territories, and now the situation is even worse because uh, no international institutions have uh, access to the territory. Uh, Ukrainian uh, government, Ukrainian uh, forces, they, they are not present in the regions. And basically, we don't know exactly what's happening. We see what happened on the occupied territories just after the deoccupation. And I know that um, Probably many of you seen the pictures from Bucha and Derpin, the Kyiv region, what happened there, the uh, like horrors which happened in the area. They are now happening in all of the other occupied regions, in Khersonsk Oblast, in Zaporizhka Oblast, Kharkiv Oblast. Again, uh, after the liberation of those cities, uh, when the Ukrainian forces enter the territories, we see the mass graves, we see destructed churches, uh, we find more information about priests who were killed, who were kidnapped, who suffered of torture. Uh, and it is uh, the policy like of this war, it's not one or two cases, it's uh, deliberate action. And also the churches that are being destroyed, they're not destroyed like by accident. It's a uh, deliberate choice of the um, military to shell the civilian infrastructure, to shell the villages, to shell the cities. And if the church is situated there, of course, the church is shelled too. Sometimes we even have uh, like uh, information about the deliberate shelling of the churches, like exactly there was a tank and it turned to the church and it fired a church directly. Uh, we have reports of religious literature being burned uh, on the street. Like we have reports of precious objects from churches being stolen by Russian army. We have reports of uh, Bibles being burned in Kyiv region, in Irpin. We have reports of uh, the seminary being attacked by Russian soldiers and uh, destroyed deliberately by Russian soldiers who lived there. So it is something that should uh, that everyone should be aware of, and it is something that's happening in Ukraine for eight months already. I think it's very important to talk about it and to understand that uh, these horrors they are still happening, and uh, uh, it is a policy and the idea of this war is destruction. And uh, the churches uh, aren't the exception. The churches are being destroyed too. The priests are being kidnapped too. The people uh, are being affected uh, and being tortured for their religious beliefs. 
lastly, I will leave you the link to the resources which I talked about, uh, so you can have more information about the situation and uh, what's going on there. I also do try to update it regularly, so you get uh, all the new reports. And uh, I thank you all for the support. Uh, and I hope that uh, I can answer all of your questions. So we'll continue our discussion. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak here and to be present at the conference. Uh, and I will be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Madluba Oleksandras, Zalian Kargeru, Chengox, Sasholeva, Masta, Tausot, Itrub. Kider Trenmogisan, we'll be tall, but let us talk about Neva, Purikshi, and Hardajera Gamohatot, Ukraine, the Bis, the Ukraine is Mimart, Ta, Shemdek Totrom, Chenim, Kitrubi, and Commentarebi. Thank you. Uh, hello, Alexandra. Very good to see you again. Um, we have uh, met at, at ETF Leuven, and I know that you know we turned uh, to Kiev. I would like to hear from you after you have described the uh, uh, very difficult situation of the churches in, in Ukraine and of religious communities in Ukraine. Um, what is um, the reaction to that? Are there ways in which the churches are resisting, um, in which they seek to, to still be serving as churches in this difficult situation? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course, there are ways uh, the churches try to resist. Uh, first of all, of course, it's humanitarian aid, uh, but uh, I'd like to also name you a few examples of uh, churches and uh, priests, pastors who are doing other activities. For example, uh, one of my friends, a uh, good friend, he is a pastor here in Ukraine. Uh, so basically the activity that he's been doing for a few months already, he is evacuating people from Mariupol. And they've done it uh, during the siege. I think uh, all of you heard that uh, during a few months, it was the hardest place in Ukraine. Uh, so basically this pastor uh, with a small team of people, group of people who support him, they try to help people to evacuate, to leave the area. Uh, it is very dangerous work, but they are doing it. Uh, and of course, there are also um, humanitarian aid projects, temporary housing, for example, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in September, uh, they just opened the first uh, temporary housing uh, kind of unit or village, uh, which they uh, was built with the support of the churches. So mm, they are, of course, trying to do the activities, uh, but it is uh, very dangerous and hard on the occupied territories. And the thing is that we don't get much information or the information, for example, uh, that sometimes we do have, uh, it's not uh, safe to like spread and talk about it. Uh, but uh, basically, priests who I know, who are from, for example, uh, Hirsonska Oblast, uh, like, thankfully, they were able to leave the area because, like, some people, it's not safe for them to be there, their families are there, and it's a long and very hard process. Uh, but they're still uh, trying to find ways, of course, to be with their uh, people and to support them, at least, like, uh, Sometimes it's online, sometimes it's uh, from the distance, uh, but uh, of course they're also trying to be with the people and uh, to show the support, uh, emotional, of, of course, too. Please. There's a question in the chat in Zoom. It's, it would be interesting to see the number of destroyed religious buildings also adjusted for their share in the total of number of religious buildings so one could see whether there was a disproportionate impact on particular religious communities. So basically how many, um, how many percent of the religious buildings were destroyed? Yeah. Uh, so the question is the percentage of religious building to overall like number of buildings or to like all the buildings that were destroyed. Could you please uh, overall? Um, 
I'd like to say yesterday I visited my friend in Irpin. It's a small town near Kiev, uh, which was also highly affected. Uh, Irpin and Bucha, they're quite close to the city. And like going there for 10 minutes, like 20, 10 minutes straight uh, while I was reaching the city center, you basically can barely see buildings that were not uh, like destroyed or uh, burned or, or not affected. So the level of destruction now, it's, uh, we don't have any data because it is just unimaginable. Honestly, I've been, uh, I thought I was prepared to go there and see because I've seen it in pictures. But when you go there and see it with your own eyes, like the half of the city is destroyed. Uh, the houses are just stained, they're just bare walls, no roofs, nothing. So it's just one or two walls and there's nothing inside. Uh, and it's just, uh, two small cities near Kyiv. Uh, we have uh, thousands of them in uh, territories uh, which were under occupation, which were in this region that are near the Russian and Belarusian borders. So we don't know the overall number of destructions and uh, it is uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of buildings. So of course I cannot uh, compare uh, the numbers, uh, but as I said in my presentation, there are facts that uh, uh, the Russian soldiers that sometimes they deliberately shelled these churches because, uh, I don't know, maybe they thought that uh, the base of uh, military are in the church or for whatever other reasons. So we do know that sometimes these shellings were deliberate. Sometimes it's just voluntarily shelling, shelling of the whole village. So uh, if the church is there, it is affected. Like, I cannot give you the percentage, but uh, uh, I don't know. I think that to begin with, uh, when the civilian infrastructure is targeted, when the civilian uh, regions are targeted, just normal villages and cities, uh, it is uh, still uh, horrible. And uh, even if the percentage of like the number of churches, all, not all the church buildings were destroyed, uh, even this data that we have to, today, it's like 2,270 uh, churches, but I think probably it's more uh, about 500 if we go to the territories that are under occupation now. So uh, the numbers are very high. Well, Alexandras. Thank you so much.